Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Did you get the message? Did you get the message? If I can draw your attention to verse 6 where Paul says, Well, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. The growth of communication is staggering for someone that's my age, and I'm 52 right now. Help us, Jesus. For someone of my age or older, the growth of communication is shocking. It is staggering. It still causes awe. This device has changed the world. This device has changed everything and so now, where it will go, who even knows? We have no idea where communication will end up. But for someone like me, anybody around my age or a little older, maybe a little bit younger, you can boldly and readily admit with me that the growth of communication is just amazing because in my day, we weren't connected like this. In my day, I didn't have a number. We had a number. Now you have a number. Everybody in this room has an individual phone number. I didn't grow up like that. I grew up where when you asked for somebody's number, you got their whole house number. If you gave somebody your number, they got the number of your house. I first met LaShawn, I met her when I was uh, 15, 16, she was 16, 17. I gave her my number because I didn't make calls, I take calls back then. I gave her my number. But the number I gave her was my house number. The phone number to my home with the phone on the wall with the long cord that you took down into the, who's talking, that you took down around the corner, when I gave her my number, I ran the risk that when she called me, my mama might answer the phone. Everybody that don't know what I'm talking about, I just want you to imagine, bro, imagine if your mom answered your phone. You keep your phone on you. Like your phone is your phone. You don't hardly, you got a secret code to your phone. If you, if you gave a girl your number and your phone rang, if you gave a dude your number and your phone rang and your mom reached to pick up your phone, you would, what would you do? To trust your mama. To answer your phone. Sorry, I know I'm not trying to talk to talk about your mom, but I had to trust my mother to answer my phone. Because there was no phone. It was the house phone. Did my mother take a message? <laughs> if you ever had the nerve to come in the house and ask your mother, did someone call you? If you had a mama like mine, you might get popped. Your mother told you, I'm not here to take you. I am not your secretary. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is just my mama. I am not your secretary, buddy. I am not here to get your man. If, if it was absolutely possible for you to miss the message, Take a message. <laughs> did, did you get my message? If somebody said to you, did you get my message? It was possible that you did not. When I met LaShawn again, when we were 19, 20, and 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, when we met again and re-met with one another, she told me, I did call you. I never knew she called me. She called me. Of course she called me. She said, I called you. When we met again, I was like, yeah, that's right. I gave you my number. You never called me. She said, oh, I called you. I called you. But your mom answered the phone. Right then, I was like, oh, here we go. She called me on a Saturday night. She called me after nine. 
because she was a heathen help us Holy Ghost. I was, and, and I had to get up and go to church. In the, I don't know why everybody's being so quiet on me this morning. My mama told her, Andy, <laughs> Andy, 9 o'clock, my mama said, Andy, like I was 8. Andy, Andy is about to go to bed because Andy got to get up and go to church in the morning. And y'all's heathen first lady laughed and said, he's a church boy. <laughs> and never called me again with her heathen self. Pray for her. I never got her message. We meet four or five years later and she's telling me, oh yeah, I called you. But you never got the message. Because it was absolutely possible for someone to call you and not get you. It was possible for someone to call you and get a eh, 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 eh. I guess I'm just talking way over people's heads. You get a busy signal. Then the answering machine came. Don't make me call you out. Date you. You had the little tape. The point of the answering machine was to record your messages that you might miss. Because it was still possible to miss someone. It was possible to call someone and not get them. And you left today. <laughs> if you leave a message on my phone today... I think something is wrong with you. I need a witness in the building. Don't even call me on my phone. Text me first. Text me first, see if I'm available. Then I might answer. But if you don't get me and you leave a message, if I see a voicemail message on my phone, I'm like, this is either my dad, only my dad leaves, <coughs> hey, well, uh, hello, son, uh, it's your father, uh, Bishop Gideon, he'll tell me his whole name, and uh, it's Thursday, what time is it? Uh, it's 11, 17, uh, and uh, it's warm out, and I, I'm just sitting there listening to, he's the only, but nobody in here young leaves a voicemail message. It don't happen. I called my son Manny, and I got his voicemail, and his voicemail basically says, if you're about to leave me a message, you clearly don't know me. If you think I'm about to listen to your message, you got another thing coming. Because back then... See, you had an answer machine, you left a message. Then there was your pager. Then everybody, don't act like I'm not the only one who remembers the pager. And you look at it and be clicked through. You had a pager with a light on it. Some of you had two. Then... The phone. And the thing about everybody having a phone and everybody is having a cell phone is that now you can't hide. You can't hide. You can't. Right now, you can't hide. If my mother calls me, if I don't pick up, I'm saying something. I can't act like, oh, I wasn't there, or I wasn't home, or I didn't get the message. My refusal to answer her is saying something to her. She might not be able to reach me one day, but if she can't reach me two days or three days, she, by the time she get me, she's like, I don't know what is going on with you. It's like there's all this too because you can't hide now. You might be able.
able to act like something is wrong. You might have an excuse about, oh, my phone was off. Oh, yeah, I was in a bad area. Oh, 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 yeah, my phone hasn't been working all that well. You don't have but so many lies to tell before somebody realizes you just don't want to talk to them. And if your call goes straight, if they call you and it goes straight to voicemail, they know you have either blocked them. I wish I had a witness in the building. You have either blocked them or you saw, because in my day, you didn't know who was calling. You picked up the phone and said, hello, who is this? Now, as soon as your phone rings, you look at it. If it's a number you don't recognize, you just put that down. If, it's, if you look at it and it's, and it's somebody, you're like, oh, my God, what does she want? You don't want to talk to them. You could just hit decline right away after a ring, it go to voicemail. You can't hide. Why am I saying all of this? It's because I'm about to remove all of your excuses. <laughs> Whatever excuse you ever might have had, <laughs> at this point now, you can't hide just like you can't hide from somebody you can't hide from God. You can't act like you didn't get the message. You can't act like you've never heard a word that can reach you. There's too many ways in which the word is being communicated these days. I know we did a little old school, no, it was the blood today. And some of that for you, it brought you back. And for some of you, it brought you back and made you feel a negative way. I grew up in an old church. So for some of you, it was like, oh, this is great. Oh, this is awesome. For some of you, you were like, oh, here we go. Because for some of us, old school church and old school communication was of such a way that we couldn't hear a message. But I'm sorry, beloved. Them excuses are gone. If you're watching around the world and you want to act like you're not hearing God because of hypocrites or you're not hearing God because of preachers or you're not hearing God because of style, you are making an excuse. The truth of the matter is that there are so many ways in which the word is being communicated. There are so many different types of preachers and so many different types of church. If you have a problem with church today, you're hiding. If you're saying, well, yeah, but blah, you are making an excuse. You are declining his call. You are sending him straight to voicemail. And believe me, he's not stupid. He knows you could get a message if you wanted to. At this point right now, if you're not hearing a message, it's because you don't want to hear it. I know, I know that there are many of us who love to hide behind the excuse of hurt and pain and lack and the fact that preachers aren't perfect. You're right, they not. But that is not an excuse for you ignoring what God is saying to you. And I came to tell somebody this morning that God has a message for you. Wherever you may be, God has a message for you. Wherever you may be, God has a word for you. Wherever you may be, I don't know where you are today, but I know one thing, there's a message for you. And God is saying, did you get my message? If God is getting a not delivered, you can act like it's because you don't have signal. And I get it. There are many of us who grew up in a place where we didn't have signal. By the time they got done, you were so bored that you couldn't get a message. But that is no longer an adequate excuse to not hear a word from God. Paul says, I'm going to give you a word today. And Paul defines the message. Paul says, let me define the message and let me just define it for you because Paul is saying, yeah, we have a message for you. I'm saying, we have a message for you. Pastor Al saying, we have a message for you. My son is saying, we have a message for you. Preachers are saying, we have a message for you. 
God is saying, oh, there's still a word. I know there's a famine in the land, but it's a famine for the hearing of the word, not the speaking. It's a famine for the hearing. It's not a famine for the speaking. Because there's more than enough speaking right now. The, at this point, beloved, believers ought to be the baddest, most full of faith, most anointed, most successful, most rich, most powerful. There is, you can hear a word every other hour if you want. We had an incredible worship experience in this room. And last Sunday, after the service was over, at the night, my brother Phil was here and did, an, uh, did a concert, and it was pretty great. But most, I mean, it was great for the folks that were here. But a lot of, for, at World Overcomers, for many of you, you, listen, you get such good music and worship on a Sunday that to come back at night for something else is kind of like, eh. Just Josh and Tam and jo just Sunday's enough. Let alone beyond Sunday, you can listen to good worship all week. The truth of the matter is, there is no reason to not get the message. Paul says, there are several messages to hear, and let me define them for you. And they don't just apply to church. The messages, they don't just apply to church. They apply to life. Because if you ignore a message from God, chances are you're going to ignore, ignore a message from other people. And if you ignore a message from other people, then chances are you're going to ignore a message from God. Don't act like you can hear from somebody and can't hear from God. And don't act like you can hear from God and can't hear from somebody. You can't love God who you don't see and hate your, your neighbor who you do see. You can't hear from God who you can't see and can't hear from the preacher that you do see. You can't hear from God who you don't see and can't hear from your neighbor who you do. It's not possible. The truth of the matter is, if you ain't hearing a message, it's because you don't want to hear what nobody has to say. Paul says, hey, let me give you the kind of messages. He says, we speak a message. Number one, he's saying, hey, we're speaking a message of wisdom. You can write that down if you're taking notes. A message of wisdom. Everybody in this room should be looking for a message of wisdom, not just in church, but in life. You can't make it in life without a message of wisdom. Every man in this room should be trying to get a message of wisdom. Every woman in this room should be trying to get a message of wisdom because it's absolutely possible to have information and not have wisdom. It's absolutely possible to have knowledge and not have wisdom. It's absolutely possible to have a feeling and not have wisdom. It's absolutely possible to have information and still not have wisdom. Wisdom is not just information but application. It's like driving school. Every now and then I'm driving down the highway and I'll see somebody driving in a driving school car because that's wisdom. That's applied knowledge. It's applied information. It's not just the information in the book. It's the application. It's like swimming in a pool. I can talk to you about stroke. I can talk to you about swimming all I want. But until you get in the water... There's no wisdom. The wisdom comes from the application. The wisdom comes from the proper application. It's not just the what, but the why. And if you've ever made a big mistake, it's because you got too focused on what and didn't focus enough on why. Wisdom is about the why of it. It's not just about the what of it. Sometimes a word of wisdom can hurt your feelings. When I was 14, my dad gave me a word of wisdom. Let me tell you the word of wisdom he gave me. He said, come here. I went in the bathroom with him. He said, come here. I went in the bathroom. He said, he pulled out a piece of floss. He opened up my mouth. He said, open your mouth. I opened my mouth. He stuck his hands in my mouth with floss. He flossed in between some of my back teeth. 
took the string out and put it under my nose. Said, smell that. He could talk to me about flossing all he wanted, but when he did that and put it under my nose and I smelled what that string smelled like. See, nobody wants to say amen on this one. It's a word of wisdom. It's an application. Some of us aren't open to any kind of wisdom. We are too sensitive for anybody to give us any kind of wisdom. We'll take information, but we don't want nobody stepping into application. Number two, he said it's a message of wisdom and it's also among the mature because there's a message of maturity. And everybody in this room ought to be able to admit, and everyone that's watching around the world ought to be able to admit, oh yeah, there's a mature message. There's a message you wish you had heard 20 years ago. There's a message when you... 30 that you wish you had had when you were 15. I'm going to talk to this side. There's a message that someone grown will give you. There's grown folk information. There's grown folk messages. And when you grown, there's an information, an application, and a thing that you see and know that you didn't know when you were younger. And your life is never going to be what it should be if you are closed off to mature messages. Can nobody older than you tell you nothing? Then you will forever be stumbling. Nothing greater than somebody that's got 20 years on you telling you, yeah, but let me tell you where you're going to be. And if you have any sense, you ought to know that already because you're now 28 and you thought you knew, you were, you knew what you were talking about when you were 18 and you now realize that you do not. Everybody in here 18 think they know what they're talking about, just keep on living. Everybody in here 25 think they know what they're talking about, just keep on living. Everybody in here who 30 who are so convinced that you know what you're talking about, give me another five years and let's see if you know what you're talking about. Have a conversation with somebody 45 and see if they won't blow your mind. And if you have a conversation with somebody 45 and you 30 and they don't blow your mind, then you're talking to the wrong person. Because there's nothing worse than talking to somebody 45 who still think like they're 30. Sometimes we think that's funny. We act like that's funny. We, we laugh at that on the sitcom. It's not funny to me. Somebody 60 who acts 18 is not funny to me. Because if there's anything that ought to come with age besides your bones and your joints cracking, it ought to be some wisdom. But we are living in a time in which we don't have enough old folk around us. We don't have enough OGs around us. We don't have enough gray beards around us. We don't have enough gray heads around us to say, can I tell you something to you really quickly? Can I make you slow down for just a second? Can you calm down for a minute, son? I was in a grocery store, and I was waiting in line, and there was a dude standing in front of me who was probably 20, 25 years younger than me, and he was standing there with a woman that was bad. When I say bad, I mean bad. I don't mean bad meaning bad. I mean bad being meaning good. She was bad. Everybody was looking at her. I got quiet. Everybody was looking at her. And he's standing with her. He might have been 24. He's standing with a girl. She bad. She dressed to be bad. Dressed for everybody to see her be bad. He's in the store. Everybody looking at her. Me, I'm watching and praying. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says uh, to watch and pray. I said, ooh, Lord, look what you done done. Uh, but then I looked at my watch, Jesus. He's in front, and I'm behind them. And you know, if you're behind folk, gentlemen, talk to me. This is a man. If you're behind some people, you get to see what God has done. You get to see what the Lord has wrought. 
And I'll tell you, I was back there looking at my watch saying, you are a wonder worker. You are a, you are a, you are a God. He was getting all upset, getting all fussy, getting upset, all disrespectful. He was fussing about folk looking at his woman. And this is where the gray beard, I reached up, I tapped him on the shoulder. He looked around. I said, son, this is what this, this whole gray, I said, son. I said, what would you rather have? A woman that people want to look at? Or someone that people are saying, you can have that. <laughs> I mean, no one's touching her. You're getting all huffy and upset over the fact that you're blessed. Sometimes the older perspective may run afoul of the message of the age. That's the third message, is a message of the age. Paul says there's the message of wisdom, there's a message of the mature, there's a message of the age. And we all have to hear the message of the age, but we all have to be careful that we're not so overwhelmed by the message of the age that we can't admit if it's wisdom or not. Because it may be absolutely possible that the message of your age has wisdom in some ways, and in other ways it does not. Paul is saying, well, it might not have been the message of this age. And what happens when there's a message of wisdom and a message of maturity that's not the message of your age? What happens when your generation's perspective is off? What happens when you find out that maybe this is not your age's message, but maybe there's still truth in it? I said something last Sunday, and it kind of went viral. Folk got all upset about something I said, and it went viral. Church Milk put it up there. I'm not going to tell you all about it. Something I said from the stage here. If you was here, it's okay. If you weren't, it's all right. And the truth of the matter is that I understand people are upset about it, and most of the folk that are upset about it are younger than me. And I totally understand. You have a millennial perspective. You have a Z perspective. But there's something. Yeah. Every now and then, you got to hear the perspective of a boomer. Every now and then, you got to hear the perspective of an Xer. And maybe there's a truth in my generational perspective that if you don't hear it just because it runs afoul of your generation's perspective, don't mean that it ain't right. I may be effective at ministering to millennials, but I'm not a millennial. That I, I have to be able to acknowledge, well, this is a message of wisdom. This is a message of maturity. This is an extra message. This is a boomer message. This is a millennial generational perspective. And believe me, any generation that becomes overly in love with their generation's perspective is in trouble. Because every generation knows and don't know. Worst thing to do is to be so stuck in one generational perspective that you can't gain nothing from the younger and you can't gain anything from the older. The fourth one, I didn't mean to spend this much time, but it's good anyway. The fourth message is a message of the ruling class. He said, this is not a message of the wisdom, not a message of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We all have to realize that there is a message of the ruling class. For many of us in this room, particularly if you're of African-American descent, if you're watching of African-American descent, many of us are victims of the ruling class and their message. Actually, our Christianity is a ruling class theology. We have been taught a theology to keep us under their thumb. We have been taught a theology to keep us divided because if we're divided, we're easier to conquer. 
We have been taught a theology of control. We have been taught a theology of guilt and shame. We have been taught a theology of God angry so that if they control the heavens, they can control the earth. Sorry. But most of us, myself included, were taught a theology that was communicated to us by a group in power. And we have to analyze and decide whether or not what they taught us the Bible meant is what it actually means. Then the fifth one, I'll leave that alone. I don't want to get in any more trouble. The fifth one is, it's a message of God. Five. Number five, a message of God. Verse seven, Paul says, no, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here it is, verse nine. He says, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. In other words, if you love God, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you love God, you ain't seen nothing yet. In other words, God has a plan. In other words, your eye hasn't seen, your ear hasn't heard, your mind has yet to conceive what God has prepared for those of us who are trying to love him. That all things work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. That your eye hadn't really seen it and your ear hadn't really heard it and your mind hadn't really conceived it. What God has prepared for those of us who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. That the point of spirituality is to get the revelation of a word that you have never heard before. In other words, God has a plan that is bigger than church. As awesome as church is, most of the time, the messages we hear just apply to church. And we come together and we just continually feed each other churchdom and churchisms and church theology and church concepts and church ideas and we make it seem as if the word and God and power and favor and spirituality only applies to church and we just consistently feed and refeed ourselves theologically and it never really applies outside of the four walls where God is saying yeah but I want you to know that the message of God is that your eye hasn't seen and your ear hasn't heard and your mind hasn't conceived. Your eye hasn't seen and your ear hasn't heard and your mind hasn't conceived. I'm going to say that one more time. Your eye has not seen. Your ear has not heard. Your mind has not conceived what God has prepared for those of us who love him. But spirituality is supposed to reveal that to you. And I would contend that until you reach a place where you're like, I never thought I'd live like this. I never thought I would drive like this. I never thought I'd be in love like this. I never thought I'd have friends like this. I never thought I'd have connections like this. I never thought I'd have money like this. I never thought I would know stuff like this. I never thought I would live like this. I never thought I would breathe like this. I never thought I would eat like this. I never thought I would be like this. Until you're there, you haven't really experienced everything that God has tried to reveal to you by his spirit. If all you've ever experienced is a nice good church service like we had today and that's awesome I love our church service and I'm glad you're watching and I'm glad you're in the room with us but the truth of the matter is beloved you ain't seen nothing yet Tell somebody, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing yet. There's something so much bigger that God has prepared for us and God is trying to reveal it to us by his spirit. God has a plan. I believe God has a plan. I said, I believe God has a plan. I said, I believe God has a plan. I think his plan is bigger than church. I think church is the doorway to get you to it. But I don't think the church is the only part of the plan. What is God's plan? Glad you asked. You see it 
at the end of Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. And I alluded to this last Sunday, and I planned on sharing it some more today and running out of time, but that's all right because in Matthew chapter 6, 11, Jesus says, Give us this day our daily bread. He's teaching us how to pray. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I've always prayed the last part as a part of the prayer. I've always prayed to God, for thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. But the New King James Version and my analysis and conversations with others have led me to believe and to now question and ask ourselves, perhaps, maybe, Jesus was teaching us how to pray. And when he got to the end of verse 13 and said, and deliver us from evil, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then he stopped and said, for yours is the kingdom and yours is the power. And yours is the glory. The reason why I'm teaching you to pray is because the kingdom belongs to you. And power belongs to you. And authority belongs. The reason why I'm teaching you how to pray is because there's a power that you have that you don't know. There's a kingdom that you can access that you don't know. There's a power that you have that y'all don't know. There's a glory that shall be revealed that you don't know. As a matter of fact, all of creation is waiting in expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Because there's a glory that shall be revealed revealed in us that the Lord don't need you at the end of the prayer to tell him what kind of kingdom he got or what kind of power he got or what kind of glory he got that Jesus paused and said you know why I'm telling y'all this because if you could only hear me I'm trying to tell you yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory I came down here for y'all to access kingdom I came down here for y'all to access power I came here for y'all to access glory I didn't come for communion just for you to have communion service. I didn't come to die and shed my blood and die a horrible death and be resurrected from the dead just so you could sing about the blood. I did this so that I could pay the price, not just for your sin, but for the kingdom. Not just for your sin, but for your power. Not just for your sin, but for your glory. And let's not act like we are not interested in kingdom and power and glory. I'll tell you right now, I am interested in kingdom and power and glory. Of course, I'm interested in God's kingdom, but I'm not just interested in God's kingdom. I'm interested in mine. Can I get an honest saint in here with me today? What's the point of all this working without a kingdom? Kingdom. Let me define them for you in the two minutes I have left. And I'm going to pray for all of you. Kingdoms, not church. We were taught kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God is just church. It's not church. The kingdom of God is much bigger than church. Kingdom is not just church. Kingdom is property. Basilia. Property. What you own. What you have. What belongs to you. For thine is property. For thine is marketplace success. Who am I talking to? For thine is contracts. For thine is access. For thine is connections. For thine is contacts. For thine is a favor that gets you in front of a king. For thine is a situation that puts you somewhere that you couldn't imagine you'd be at. For thine is the expectation for you to be the lender and not the borrower. For thine is for you to have the expectation for you to be above only and not beneath. For thine is not for you to be a forever slave class in which you forever serve the ruling class and forever are the meat of the ruling class. No, for thine is for you to say, let me believe God. Let me march in here. Let me sit in my car and talk to God. And let me say, I'm about to go in here. I'm going to get this promotion. I'm going to be the one running this whole company. For thine is some dominion. The ruling class wanted us satisfied with heaven. God wants us interested in power in the earth. Work 
in the dirt. Work in the dirt. Kingdom is work in the dirt. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this earth. If it was, my soldiers, my angels would come and fight for me. He made a distinction between his kingdom and ours. He said, but y'all, you're going to have to have a kingdom you fight for. I don't know if anybody's got a kingdom that they're fighting for. There's a kingdom I'm fighting for. I wish I had a witness. There's a kingdom that I am fighting for. I have children. I'm fighting for their kingdom. There's a, I have babies. I don't want them to be broke like me. My God, I have babies. I don't want them to have to go through what I went through. Who am I talking to? I have children. I don't want them to struggle. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. The devil is a liar. That's not how nobody make no money. Everything I'm doing right now is for my babies. Everything I'm doing right now is to put my sons in a position that I was never in. I don't want them to struggle like us. I don't want them to be hungry like us. I don't want them to be scared like us. I don't want them to get a job. I don't want them to go to school to get a job. I want them to go to school to expand their mind. I want them to own their own. I want them to have their own business. I'm so tired of us buying from everybody and paying everybody. I'm so tired of us buying hair products from people that don't have hair like us. My God, I am so tired of us being happy with a job and not excited about kingdom. If you're going to have faith for anything, you might as well have faith for kingdom. This thing is not just about me, it's about kingdom. This thing is not just about me, it's about my babies. Who am I talking to? This thing is about the kingdom. Jesus said, yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you feeling like, yeah, yeah, this is mine. Jesus appeared to Abraham and said, I'm your shield, you very great reward. Abraham said, yeah, that's really great. But what, re what can you really do for me? When I remain childless, and Eleazar of Damascus is going to inherit everything I have. In other words, I mean, you can keep giving me stuff, and I love the fact that you're appearing to me and talking to me, but it's not enough. It's not enough for you to talk to me if you're not going to give me a kingdom. It's not enough for you to talk to me if you're not going to give me somebody to leave my stuff to. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Everybody say power. Now, I know when we say power, we just think Holy Ghost power, power, Lord. Praise God for Holy Ghost power. But there's other power besides Holy Ghost power. One of the reasons why everybody tried jamming the church and everybody trying to be in a church and everybody want to be on stage and everybody want to be a prophet. Everybody want to give a prophetic word on, on, on everybody's parking lot. Everybody want to, everybody want to do that is because it's the only power we ever really see. Because we've been limited to only church power. They don't want us to have any other kind of power. So they told us to have church power. They told us to have heavenly power. Because they don't want us to have the real power. But, but power is authority. You can write it down. I'm running out of time. I'm out of time. It's good though. It's authority. It's wealth. Wealth is power. Influence is power. Wisdom is power. Revelation is power. Fruit in a drought is power. I want you to have power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That dunamis power, I don't just want you to have prayer power. I'd love for you to have some authority power. I'd love for you to have some say power. I'd love for you to have some money power. I wish I had a witness in the building. I wish I'd love for you to have some wisdom power. I'd love for you to have some revelation power. I'd love for you to make decisions that you can't explain and then something happens and you are right in line. Can I get a witness in the building? I don't know if you ever drive past the, the Powerball number thing. I was driving through. I live in North Carolina. The Elder Clark, I was driving through. And I live in North Carolina. I was driving through and I saw a Powerball, North Carolina Powerball number and it was like 125 million. I said, Jesus, uh, come on, Lord. Give me a number, G. Uh, nothing would make me happy. You, Lord, you want to speak a number to me. 
What's the number? What's the number, Jesus? Give me the number. I'll tithe. Anybody ever say, I know I'm not the only one. Lord, I will tithe. Oh, I'll tithe from that. Come on, don't act like I'm the only one. I know I'm not, I'm not I'm the only one. What I always think, Pastor Al, is who can I trust to play this number for me? Because if I win, y'all are going to know I gambled. Some of y'all are going to be like, can you believe Pastor Andy done played the Powerball? I mean, I like Pastor Andy, but I mean, he played a Powerball, girl. I can't go there no more. It's like, so I'm trying to think, who can I give the number to? Who can I trust? Maybe I can give it to first because y'all, first ladies ain't saved no way. Or maybe I can give it to my son. Maybe I can give it to my son. Maybe I can give it. Who am I going to give it to? Imagine, beloved, if you, and I know that's funny, but imagine if you started to pray and say, Lord, tell me what's going to happen next. Lord, tell me what piece of property is about to be valuable. Lord, I know I'm not the only one mad about downtown Durham. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Maybe I'll just leave it alone. But when I moved here, downtown Durham, there was dust balls rolling down. It was like a western. I mean, it was nothing in downtown. Now, what would you do if you could go back in time and talk to yourself about something? Imagine now if God gave you a word of revelation. Can I speak that over your life right now? A word of revelation that's not just about church. Yeah, and the Lord would say unto you, my brother, you are encouraged. How about the Holy Ghost speak to you and say, buy that? And you say, Lord, buy that. It's, uh, what am I buying that for? Just buy it. Just get it. Go down there and buy it. I'm going to set it up. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it happen. And you're going to go and you're going to have this thing. They're going to give you favor. And you're going to end up with a piece of property. And I know. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going I'm I'm to go before you. And you're going to have a conversation. And the person's going to say to you, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this. Whenever somebody says, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm like, work Holy Ghost. Work Holy Ghost. Work Holy Ghost. I want favor. I don't just want favor in here. I want favor on my life. I want favor on my money. I speak it over everybody. I want favor on your business idea. I want favor. You figured out through COVID they don't care about you. All right, care about yourself, baby. And get some kingdom and some power and then get some glory and be all right about having some glory. Be all right about folk liking you. Be all right about people being mad at you. Be all right about people hating on you. Be all right about people being upset about how blessed you are because the glory is credit. The glory is appreciation. The glory is being healthy. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. And my prayer for us in the room and around the world is that what our eyes have not seen, and what our ears have not heard, and what our minds have not conceived, that God will reveal this to us by his spirit and that it is a message of wisdom among the mature that there is something so much bigger than just church. I have been in church my whole life. If you have been made to go to church, raise your hand. If you was made to go, some of you were made to come here today. I was made to go. I was forced to be saved. You couldn't be in my parents' house and not be saved. Who am I talking to? Made. Praise God for church. But there's something so much bigger than it. And it's kingdom. And my prayer is that we will access God's power like never before. Put your hands together if you heard a word from the Lord. Can I get you to give to that? Can I get you to give to that? Can I get you to sew on that really quickly? Can I get you to sew? Hey, I know that we've got the QR codes now, and so you can just, you can just, it's, it's right through push pay. I've been taking up a second offering, and I'm asking you to give around the world. I'm asking you to give in this room. I'm going to pray for you in just a second, but it's, I, I, I do want to pray for you. I want to pray God's blessing on you, but I want to pray God's blessing on your obedience. Can I get you to give to the work of the kingdom of God?
just something above your tithes and your offerings. And I've got, we've got this vision Sunday that's happening the first Sunday in September. And I've got a vision for you, beloved. And we've got some property that we're about to build on. And it's a kingdom vision. It's not just a church vision. It's a kingdom vision. And I'm trying not to talk to you about it. And if you need an offering envelope, you can raise your hand. But the QR code is on the envelope. And the QR code is right there on the screen. And if you take a picture of it, the QR code is on your screen right now. And the whole 77977, that push, that number, is that whole thing is gone now. And, uh, and so if you can take the QR code. It's, there's giving kiosks. These these not giving kiosks, but these giving boxes. If you're kind of like, I don't want to touch a bucket. There's bo- there's there's uh, the giving boxes that are secure in the doors, and you can get the QR code. Can I get you to give? Can I get you to give above and beyond your tithe? Can I get you to give an offering to the house of God? Can I get you to say, All right, I'm trusting God. This whole theme of this of this service today has been faith in God. You don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray that God will bless you coming and going. I'm going to pray that the power of God and the favor of God will rest on you. Because you are looking at someone. I'm not the only one. You are looking at someone who right now is saying, I am in a life that my eye had never seen. My ear had never heard. My mind had never conceived what God has done for me never would have thought I lived in North Carolina I never would have thought I live in a house like I live if you don't like me you can't come to my house because it'll make you really mad the Lord has blessed me the Lord didn't just bless me through y'all the Lord blessed me because I had the courage to believe that he could work a miracle in my life sometimes I just sit back and wonder at what he's done it makes me careful about what I pray for now I honestly believe that whatever is on the head is on the house can I get a witness in the building whatever is on the head is on the house and Jesus is the head I'm a sheep like y'all But I decided to believe God. I want you to believe God with me. I'm going to pray for you right now. We're going to pass this bucket. If you're giving through the bucket or if you're giving right now, you're giving through that app. You're giving. I want you to give in faith. I've never been this blessed. I've never given as much as I've given. It's so interesting how my life went to another level when I started giving at another level. It's just the truth. Started giving at another level. For a long time, I was just me. as Pastor Andy and I wasn't under nobody. Disappointed by leadership over me when I decided to reconnect and give, something happened in me. It broke a yoke over You'll have to forgive me because I've been so careful about taking everybody's money, but I want to give you access to power, and it's your faith. Lord, I just want to thank you for faith in the room. I want to thank you for faith around the world. I want to thank you for everyone that's watching wherever they may be. Thank you for everybody that's in the room with us. Thank you, Lord God, for the thousands in the room. Thank you for the millions around the world that this can access. And God, we pray for power. Lord, we want to believe what Jesus said, that ours is the kingdom, and ours is the power, and ours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take our offering and multiply it supernaturally to the upbuilding of your kingdom. Take it, God, as a measure of our faith. As we move forward, 
for folk in Africa, touch their money. For folk in India, touch their situation. For folk in Australia, touch their situation. For folk in Canada, touch their moment right now. For all of us to happen to be in the United States of America, touch our moment. For all of us, Lord God, who may not be in the ruling class, break the yoke over us. For all of us that live in this great state of North Carolina, for all of us, Lord God, who live in this area, have thine own way, God. Take our offering and multiply it supernaturally to the upbuilding of your kingdom. Let the anointing of God rest on us like never before. And God, may there be miracles that break out amongst us. May we have testimonies of wealth and favor and power and connection. Have your way in us. Give us favor with you and with man. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Amen. God bless you as you give. As that bucket passes you or whatever, you can just jump on your feet. If you've given on your phone, you can jump on your feet. It's 1215. I'm sorry. I know we went a few minutes over. Some of us grew up in a church where the preacher didn't get up till 1. It was good for us to be here. Amen. It's good for us to be in church. It's good for us to come together again. You can invite somebody to come to church with you. As you can see, 10 o'clock service, we're going to keep having it. And you're watching around the world, but you can come and worship with us. You don't have to register. You can just come and be in service. We had seats today, and so you were able to come and worship with us. But if you want to watch stream, that's awesome. Praise God. Come on, let me pray for you one more time before you go. Don't move because they may be collecting something in the buckets. Just give me one more second, one more second, one more second. Hallelujah. That's right. Praise him, baby. We will be letting you know, children's ministry, when it's going to be back. Um, I, I'll let you know. It's We're still watching COVID and numbers and all of it. And b- beloved, for all you know, we may, we're going to have church as long as we can have it. If something happens and some spikes and something, else, well, we'll go back to what we were doing before. But we will serve the Lord. I love that song that we sang today. We're not going to stop praising Him. Come on, let's pray together. God, thank you for our time together today. Thank you for your word that's a lamp into our feet and a light into our pathway. Lord, thank you for that extra time we took today just in communion to fellowship with you, to partake of your supper, and to receive salvation. Now, God, we ask you to dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Cover us with your blood. As we leave, as we go home, God, let your power fall on us. And more than just on a Sunday way, let it fall on us on a Monday way and a Tuesday way and a Wednesday way. God, give us access to kingdom power and glory. And we'll praise you for what you do. For everyone that's in the room, for everyone that's watching around the world, God, we are determined to access the favor of God. And we believe you now for power. Have your way in us. God, as we always pray, bless your people. Make your face shine upon your people. Be gracious to your people. And give us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Till we're able to be together again. God, as we always pray, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, you're our rock, you're our redeemer. We love you in Jesus' name. We all sit together. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. See you next Sunday, Wednesday night.